used to advance HPB surgery in the Americas. Uh, one of the things Scott asked me to do is give some perspective on where uh, we've come from in terms of evidence-based surgery, and that's very difficult in the limited amount of time, but I think we could basically say that this started in the 50s and 60s primarily with trials relating to tuberculosis and led in part by a man named Bradford Hill whose name has kind of disappeared into the past. Archie Cochran, after whom the Cochran Collaboration has been named, uh, started to push very strongly for randomized control trials and the solution of uh, different uh, types of uh, therapeutic issues. Dave Sackett and the group at McMaster uh, further advanced uh, our thinking in terms of what a randomized control trial was, how they should be structured and developed, and he in fact participated in the development of the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, which happens to be situated in Oxford, uh, but which, and which is led presently uh, by Paul Glasiu, an Australian. Now, that does seem to uh, imply that most of this thinking has come out of uh, the United Kingdom, and that's not entirely true, but they have certainly been leaders in this area. And I think it is worth pointing out that surgery in many ways has lagged behind in its adoption of many of the principles associated with evidence-based uh, medical principles. This point was made rather uh, bitingly by Richard Horton in an editorial in The Lancet, which uh, offended a great many surgeons because of the first paragraph, which was rather cheeky and not impolite, but very pointed. But if you read the second and third paragraph, uh, you'll find that he comes up with a number of very interesting ideas that are worth pursuing. And it's uh, those ideas that the uh, collaboration I'll refer to uh, later is trying to uh, pursue. But if we ask the question, what is evidence-based medicine, I'll run very quickly through the basic principles. It's basically geared around these five issues. You define the question, and that is much more difficult than most of us think it, it is. We uh, may say, well, which is the better operation, this or that? But when you define the question, it turns out to be a far more refined issue than you might imagine. You must search the literature to find out what's gone on before, and it is an area that in medicine and surgery we tend not to bother with, thinking that our study uh, will be the only answer. Learning to critically appraise the literature is crucial, and then the ability to apply those results either to a patient or a population is the issue, and then evaluating outcome. And you will see clearly that that is an audit cycle. There are two key tools to evidence-based surgery. The first is search methodology, and learning how to search the literature is no longer reading your own CV, but actually finding out what other people have uh, written about the subject, uh, and sometimes finding out what has happened to studies that never got uh, to be published. And then critical appraisal is a highly refined process uh, by which you critically appraise an article. This has led to a hierarchy of evidence where you have levels of evidence of one to five, and I can outline those for you later. There's not time right at the moment, but the top of the, the, top of the list are uh, homogeneous uh, randomized control trials or meta-analyses of homogeneous randomized control trials. The fifth level is opinion, and that, that I like to refer to as eminence-based medicine and is not usually or often not quite the quality the eminent people think it is. Grades of recommendation are A to D, and that's also a well stratified and accepted in the literature. This gives you a pyramid of the hierarchy of evidence with systematic reviews incorporating homogeneous uh, RCTs all the way down to the green at the bottom, which is expert opinion. So do we do it in surgery? So I'm going to outline just two issues because I think there are two key things in surgery. We often don't do enough of the high quality trials, uh, but secondly, when we do them, we often don't pay any attention to them. So I, I reviewed for, partly for this meeting and for another meeting, 
the hepatobiliary articles in these five major surgical journals uh, in the years uh, noted. And you'll see here that uh, there are really only five of the 118 papers uh, listed in those years which were randomized control trials. There were two cohort studies, uh, three meta-analyses, and all the rest were uh, basically uh, case reports or case series uh, with many of the usual flaws that are associated with them. The other side of the coin, of course, is that sometimes we do come up with randomized control trials that come up with a very clear answer. And, and if you follow the literature for abdominal drainage and elective liver resection, you'll find that it really uh, is not necessary. Yet I will bet you the family farm that at least 50% of the surgeons in this room still drain their livers. And, they'll, and, they, and they will always say, well, I was worried. Um, it was a tough case. My boss did it. Uh, but in fact, the data tells us, including a Cochrane database, that it's not necessary. So we have these two problems. We often don't do the studies. And when you have very good evidence, if we don't like it, we don't follow it. The rules of evidence that's applied to surgery, I think, are somewhat different. And uh, that's also part of our problem as a procedure-based specialty. So the hypothesis uh, that we propose to this group, I'll mention in a moment, is that the rules of evidence are different for surgical procedures. Procedures is in red because it applies to gastroenterologists and radiologists as well, but we're here on surgery. Now, if you think about how we evaluate things, uh, I think it is, it has to be clear that randomized control trials are the apex of this hierarchy of evidence, along with systematic reviews. There are, however, a large number, and it's unclear how big that space is or that area is, where other types of evidence will be required to find out what the correct answer is. It's defining what those other types of evidence are that surgery has a responsibility uh, to develop. So our particular interest relates to innovation. And the key question is how is a new operation or procedure introduced into clinical practice and how is it evaluated so you can get it there. So with this in mind, a group was invited to Oxford entitled the Balliol Collaboration because it took place at Balliol College in Oxford, made up of trialists, methodologists, surgeons, statisticians, and, and skeptics, people who, who weren't quite clear on what they thought about these issues, but we're very inclined to say no. The challenge was to how do you get a procedure from first in man to either a testable procedure or one that was a gold standard without, with or without an RCT. And one of the pathways is, was outlined here, and this was very early on in our procedure, but, but you see you have first in man and you